Mm. It is really sad. You know, I was in Qatar, and I think it's fair to say the story. So I was in Qatar, and they had invited me to talk about um, the challenges that new Muslims face. <clears throat> I said, sure. So I go in, mind you, look at the setting. I go in, this is supposed to be a da'wah center. This is supposed to be a da'wah center, and I'm supposed to be basically talking about and giving lectures to those that are basically doing da'wah. And what? Well, struggles that new Muslims face. So I come in, and before you know, you start giving the, the lecture, you need to know the audience, you need to know, you know, they were they were almost 30, you know, 35 people. So I was like, well, you know, definitely oh. looking at the faces, I could see, you know, I'm I'm pretty good with catching with catching people's races and backgrounds. But I yeah. could see in front of me that I'm seeing people definitely from an Indian, Sri Lankan, Ethiopian. I could see it right there. So in yeah. people, and I said, can you tell me, can you, can each and every single one of you actually tell me what background you come from? And I was right. They were Filipino. They were Sri Lankan. They were um, Indian, um, wow. Ethiopian. They were these cultures. And I said, were you all born Muslim? It turned out that almost 85% of them were actually reverts. So I said, Allah well, Allah. I to lecture you on a subject like this. It makes no sense for me to come and lecture you. So she said, no, no, I want you to continue with this. I was like, fair enough. Then an American woman, obviously blonde and blue eyed, comes in, doesn't even sit with the group and sits right in the middle. Now, mind you, there were chairs the chairs were all around, all right, and also making like a U shape and also in the middle. But all the others who were working in Dawa, they all sat, Filipino, Sri Lankan, whatever, all these cultures, mm -hmm. they sat in the back. This American woman sits in front, so in other words, segregated from everyone. And then I start speaking in English. But then the lady that is supposed to be the MC, she said, talk in Arabi, talk in Arabi. And I said, talk in Arabi. And I said, why don't, let's ask them, what language would you prefer that I speak in? And then she said, no, 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 no. It's like, oh, they don't understand. But they don't understand. So if they don't understand what I'm saying, why are they even there? I mean, why that... are they even there? And mind <laughs> you, these people are actually they have degrees in Dawa and they have degrees in Islamic studies, and some of them actually speak three and four languages. You want to tell me Mayif Tehmoon? You want to tell me that these people are stupid? That they should not even be whatsoever given the choice? to choose whether they should actually have the, the lecture in English or in Arabi. So then I said, let's vote. How many people want the language the language to be in, in English? Majority rose their hand and they basically said, English, please, but speak slower. I said, sure, I'll speak slower and I'll use English. What, what did the administration say? Were they like having a cow then? Oh, 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 so oh, hold on. So sorry, sorry. Then, oh, oh, hold on. Let me let me get to it. Then okay. I start the lecture as basically with the powerpoints as basically agreed on, and I start talking about the challenges and you know the different challenges A, B, C, and they were sharing some of their own stories of what they went through, the Filipino, you know, the Sarankin, whatever, because they too were, they were actually reverts. In other words, they were supposed to be teaching me, not me teach them. Yes. And fine. this is real. And then after finishing the lecture, this MC person and basically the people, the administration, they come in and, and 
you know, I was after I was having all these conversations with the rest of the people, the rest of the audience, the non-white, or at least the, the, the ones that were from all over the world. After having all these conversations, then the administration takes me to their office and she said, you know, all that you had said about the struggles, that does not apply to them. I said, what do you Are mean? Are you that kidding? They have them? even more struggles than any other reaver. This is what she said. SubhanAllah, said, because these oh, struggles do yeah. not apply to them. They only apply to the white American and, and European women. Wallahi al-azim. This is what she said. That these struggles only apply to the white and blonde American and European women. This is even. I, I've heard like stories about like, you know, if, uh, people from Ethiopia and from the Philippines, like they have extreme hardships with their family. You know, and not I, just that, but these people I, are, are maids. You know, their what? situation is already I was hard. Actually, I was actually I wanting to get some support from these organizations. So they said, well, can we see what you what you do? Can we see the classes? Can we see the images of the attendees? Well, certainly, most of those that were attending Gems of Light are people of color. They're mm -hmm. predominantly Somali, predominantly um, West Africa. So we have a lot of color. And one of them literally said, where are the blonde women? I said, blonde women? What does that have to do with anything? Looking for blonde women. You know, I'm like, I'm not here doing matchmaking. <laughs> well, not just that, but like, everybody's this wearing hijab. Is... So nobody even knows who what it, color hair. Yeah, it's that racism. Oh my even God. in the way that they embrace Muslims and the way they interact with them is so condescending. You know, that I should have actually added and put it as part of the struggles that new Muslims face is nothing but racism from the Muslim community. That should have actually been one key thing. But I didn't know what was, what was happening, to be honest. But that is supposed to be a key thing. A number of the women that you are probably shocked yourself. I was right? shocked. I was shocked. How is it that they can be so racist? But when you actually, and that's a fitna, when you feel mm -hmm. that the Muslims are actually racist and you know having this amount of discrimination against, oh yeah, that's a fitna for, for their. It's a fitna, in, it's a fitna for somebody um, that is of color to come yeah, in and feel that. I'm because I'm African American, or because I am um, Ethiopian, or because I am of of color, that somehow I basically am treated like a second class. That somehow I'm disregarded. My my humanity is disregarded. I'm stripped away from my humanity. I'm stripped away from from basically my 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 own um my own race is actually seen like it doesn't even belong as a part of the human race. This is another fitna because you would, if you're a new Muslim and you see that these people are treating you in such a class and where the kuffar, the kuffar are not treating you that way and that the kuffar right now are speaking about ending racism and even if it's not necessarily all the way true, but still. There is at least a certain rhetoric, a certain narrative, a certain uh, embracement for ending racism. But when you would see that the Muslims are actually embracing racism and refusing and refusing that it at all exists within the community, that is even harder. That is even harder. That's a fitness. Because when you're seeing the hypocrisy within the Muslim community, it becomes another fitna. Am I in the wrong? Am I in the wrong place here? What just happened? Did these people actually preach other than what they had? Uh, that they they practice other than what they had preached. What was what, what's going on? 
you would then get confused. So it's a real fitna, even for those that are new Muslim. It's a big fitna, especially if they are of color. It's a huge fitna. It's a huge fitna. Allahul Musta'an. So that's why I wanted to actually, um, Aisha Ma'an, that's why I actually wanted to ask about racism, because it is beyond there. Anyhow, so, <clears throat> sorry everybody, but racism is a very, very sensitive topic to me. Um, because remember, as a young girl, I basically, um, you know, witnessed racism and I was actually considered, and that was in um, the 80s. So the only girls that would play with me uh, as a young girl in public schools in America were really the African-American girls because I was treated like non-white. So I completely understand and relate the amount of racism. I was in a predominantly, at one point, predominantly African-American. And then we moved to a very white uh, community at the time it was Brooklyn Center. It was a very white community. But right now, of course, it's 67% actually non-white, believe it or not. And believe it or not, it's Liberians that are actually taking uh, the uh, the majority among uh, along with the Hmong in Brooklyn Center. But at the time in the 80s, it was actually predominantly white. So I was treated like I was African-American. I was non-white. And therefore, I definitely have, uh, let's say, a high allergy and a high recognition to racism. And I know how not only the impact on children, but even the impact in uh, the impact it has in living your life, even justice, all of that. Um, every single day, we were basically going to the principal's office simply because we are be we were being attacked for being non-white and then the principal would basically think that oh you're you're here back to the office because that i attacked other people not that i was attacked and trying to defend myself and that's the same thing is that many times those that are of color are actually treated like they're the ones that provoked a problem. They're the ones that are violent. They're inherently violent. Not that they're actually responding to some condescending comment or some perhaps rude behavior or that they were responding to some <clears throat> action that someone actually started. And then the media or even they would be portrayed that they're just inherently violent. They're not inherently violent. They were basically um, a product of all the racism that was actually there. They are right now really projecting to the uh, projecting and retaliating to a lot of the racism that basically comes at them. So they're not inherently violent but they're actually a product of what they had committed. And then they end up really facing all of that and needing to defend themselves. So it's exactly the way that Palestine is portrayed. It's like, oh, Palestinians are the ones that are terrorists, et cetera, and all of that. When in reality, it's that Palestinians are reacting to the Israeli genocide. They are reacting to the Israeli terrorism and reacting to the terrorism, of course, the media would portray it as if it is basically terrorism right there and not that it's a retaliation <clears throat> to the colonization that was <clears throat> that was basically funded by the U.S. and even a lot of the Western countries. Anyhow, so, so we won't go into all the other, um, all the other things and it's really important, I guess, summarize just this piece of it. Um, it's important to get to know the other Muslims. Get to know your Muslim brother and sister and don't use whatsoever um, a race as your doorway to judge somebody. And remember that somebody could be from another race that could actually beat you to Jannah. They could beat you to Jannah. So never think of yourself as superior not because of your ilm, not because of your race, and not because of your appearance, and not because of your status, and not because of your wealth. Because the real value is not the value of all of the things that I had mentioned. The true value, even if it's a degree, the true value 
is the value of your core on the inside. The true value is really your qalb, is really your spirituality, is really your taqwa. That's the true value. So the second you condescend anyone, the second you look down at anyone, just keep in mind that that moment could be the moment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring it up into your face and that person will be laughing at you where they will enter Jannah and you will not. Allahul Mustahil. All right. <clears throat> oh, I just received news today. SubhanAllah. I have a friend here. Actually, she's in one of like the Arabic class I'm in with. And SubhanAllah, her husband just uh, passed away, you know, and uh, she has kids and stuff. And you, you never know when your last day is. You never know. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. All right. So what we're in, Allah irham hu rabbi and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her the sabr and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, amen, amen. Uh, shed his mercy on uh, her husband. Allahumma amin. All right. So لا خير في كثير من ندوهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين الناس وما يفع ذلك بدقاء مرضات الله فسوف نؤتيه أجر عظيمة We're still in Surah النساء آية 114 We also did the آية وما يشاقق الرسول من بعد ما تبين له الهدى ويتابع غير سبيل المؤمنين نوله ما تولى ونصله جهنم وساءت Masira. So we did actually go over these two ayat yesterday. Um, to summarize, we said that most of the private talk that they were engaging in or the talk that they were engaging in was basically um, to plot against the Muslims. That's what most of it was. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to not judge every single private conversation as being something that does not contain good within it, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts that exception. The only exception for the private talk is basically for a person that orders for a good contribution or even a good behavior, good action, or even reconciliating between people. And of course, if the person had done any of these, only if they had the intention, which is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those would be the only ones that would be granted the reward or the magnificent reward on judgment day we went in details in different in different of course um a hadith and we went in details the difference between al-qada and al-islah the day before it so no need to go over that one again and we went in details about what yushaqiq means and it's basically dividing or going against the prophet peace be upon him after a huda after Guidance was clarified to him, brought, of course, into, into um, that state where they're capable of seeing it. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رسولي, That the Lord Almighty would not uh, punish any people until they had actually received the message. And number two, so the first one, the first segment of it was number one, the Prophet going against the Prophet and number two, follow the path of other than the believer's path. I want you to look at other than the believer's path because this is important to keep in mind that the believer's path or being within the, the Muslim ummah is a key to actually connecting, normalizing because, of course, and I would like to here just say another thing is that, of course, Studies actually say that by being, if you are, for example, with somebody that is successful, by being with successful people, you are increasing your chance of being successful by almost 15%. And by being with people that are not successful, you are decreasing your chance by 30%. And this is important to keep in mind. Because that's the same thing. By being around the mu'mineen, you are increasing your chance of being a mu'min. By being with the non-mu'mineen, of course, you are increasing or decreasing your chance of being of the mu'min, but increasing your chance of being with the kafir. And this is extremely important to keep in mind. You are basically with the people that you flock with. You are basically... <clears throat> You are basically going to be coming in with the faith and also the behavior of those that you hang out with. So that's why Nuwalihi Matawalla. Watch and look at this one because when we turned off yesterday the 
the live streaming. So um, uh, Noura asked the question, what does fa really mean in particular? When you look at both of these words, let's actually put an underline underneath them, this one and this one. They both actually come from the verb wa When you look at the word wa we said before that this verb actually means number one. It means the the area that is of authority, the authority. Number two, the place of decision making, and of course, the area of victory and area of success. Now, when you look at nuwalihi matawalla. So, what was the beginning? Well, the beginning was they actually had chosen an area that is considered their area of authority. They considered an area of the decision making. They basically considered an area that was supposed to be an area of victory. In other words, they were supported by that area. They basically used them as an authority. And number three, they basically made the decisions and, and acted upon these three segments. Now, when you look at that, nuwalihi would basically mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is going to let this area of authority be their area of authority because that's what they regarded. They regarded that area of authority, whether it's an it's a it's a lifestyle or whether it's a person, or whether it's an ideology, at the end of the day, is that if this person had regarded that center as their authority, as their area of reference, and number two, they basically were supported by those that followed this lifestyle, then they're going to find themselves acting upon, in their decisions, acting upon the, that center itself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, fair enough. Then in that situation, <clears throat> If you want victory, you're basically going to be amongst that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had determined are not going to be the ones to get victory. So therefore, you're going to be, by definition, amongst the groups that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had regarded as the ones to not get victory, to not get mercy, and to not be guided. That's the same thing. In where, remember, if it's an authority, that means it's either Allahu Akbar, or it's going to be taking a shaitan. It's either the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the path of a shaitan. If it's the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, that means Allahu Mawlana. That means that's why even when, um, when Umar ibn al Khattab and when Umar ibn al Khattab, when the Prophet was in Uhud, and of course Abu Sufyan comes over, who was not Muslim at the time and a number of different chieftains from Quraysh, they, can't, they come in and they start boasting to the people of Quraysh, to the, to the Muslims, sorry, and to start boasting and saying um, um, uh, that Hubal, which is the deity that, they, the, the deity that they worshipped at the time, so they started boasting that that is their God. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said to the Prophet what should we answer? And he said, respond, so here's the word. I want you to look at this one because this is key to faith. All right. When we say this is key to faith. So when we look at this is basically saying that there are at the opposite of Allahu Mawlana wala Mawla lahum. This is basically Allahu Mawlana and they would have no Mawla. <clears throat> when we say Allahu Mawlana, that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our center. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our place of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our place, uh, uh, is the place in the area that we would embrace principle from. So therefore, nuwallihi matawalla, that actually means what they would regard on the other hand is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not their center. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not their place of decision making. Therefore, they would be al bi Allah dhullahu I want you to look at the sentence right here. Man istaz bi Allahu dhullahu Whoever would regard other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
as their place of izzah, as their place of honor, then Allah Taala would let that place or that person humiliate them. Honor is the opposite of humility. Humiliate. Remember, to give honor is the opposite of to give to <clears throat> to humiliate. So here, man Same thing. If the person seeks mercy from that center, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to let the person recognize that that person that they thought was their place of mercy was actually the place that would be giving them more pain. If they would consider a particular ideology was going to give them victory or going to give them guidance, they're going to see that that place was going to give them nothing but <clears throat> but loss and nothing but misguidance. If they thought that area was going to give them power, all they're going to see is nothing but defeat through that. So I want you to look at paradigms in the Quran and in, in, in the Quran, even in the Sunnah, that part about paradigm and realizing patterns is always there. The Quran always uses patterns to help people recognize patterns. It's really interesting. I was reading in this in this book for Jonathan Leon's. <clears throat> it's called House of Wisdom. And he was actually talking about one main reason, and I never thought about it really, um, one main reason why Islamic art contains a lot of patterns. So you would see, you look at the Islamic art and it's either, you know, circles upon circles or squares upon squares or lines upon lines and the list goes on and on, was really um, inspired by the Quran because the Quran was basically inspiring the Muslims to look in nature and recognize that there are all these patterns. So therefore, the, what the Muslims had seen through the Quran and through nature was always seeing patterns. So then they started uh, replicating that into their art in where it's all about making patterns, circles upon circle, uh, triangle upon triangle, and square upon square. And then you come out with this pattern of art where it's all about really patterns and recognizing the art, <clears throat> the beauty of pattern. So it, it's quite interesting. I, you know, uh, when he said, I was like, I never thought about it that way, but that's, uh, you know, I never thought about <laughs> I never thought about the inspiration that I actually got it from the Quran or that we got it from the Quran, but it's it's really interesting um, to actually find that because it is a way where you really do find in the Quran where it's always giving you these similes, always giving you these patterns, always giving you certain paradigms to recognize where this is uh, where this is taking you. So when you look at min ba'di ma tabayyana lahu al-huda so after they had seen al huda but then they followed the path of the disbelievers, then what they're going to be finding, even though they had thought that they were going to get um, il iman, they thought they were going to get um, guidance, they thought that they were going to get victory, they thought that they were going to get um, uh, some kind of a higher status, etc. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, well, in other words, what you're really going to get. That's a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you're really going to get is not victory, but the opposite. What you're really going to get is basically loss. What you're really going to get is even worse than all of that, perhaps in dunya, in akhirah, wa nuslihi jahannam. In akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, okay, so this sister is basically saying it's similar to abasa wa tawalla. So it does come from the same root. Tawalla, tawalla actually means to turn away. Okay, so this is uh, this is yes, it comes from the same root, but it's not actually coming with the same uh, with the same meaning whatsoever. Because nuwalihi ma tawalla, you're looking at the word tawalla. So this tawalla is different than abasa wa tawalla. All right, um, tawalla here uh, actually means to take as uh, as authority as leadership etc but abasa wa tawalla the tawalla in surah abasa is not to consider that the prophet had taken whatsoever quraysh as an authority 
but this was actually meaning that the Prophet ﷺ was turning away, turning away from um, uh, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. So that's slightly different. Um, the context is different. So therefore, the interpretation is going to be different. <clears throat> but good that you brought it up. وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا This the Jahannam, they, they will be exposed to Jahannam. وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا And of course, we talked about سَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا and سَاءَ يَسُوءُ and سِيَ All of those are basically to express when something is detested, when something is not good, when something is basically containing an evil consequence. So in masir is basically the consequence. All right. In Allah, لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. The Lord Almighty does not forgive associating partners with Him. Yet He does forgive what is beyond that. Um, so um, when we're speaking about give forgive what is beyond that, to mean forgiving what is beyond, uh, forgiving what is beyond shirk. To forgive what is beyond shirk, meaning. The actions, the behavior that one might do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the action if the person had repented from it. And even if they didn't repent from it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would still forgive them. Eventually, they will be basically included in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if a person didn't repent, they'll eventually be leaving hellfire. All right. Whoever associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about tawheed. We said it's in three different areas. We said tawheed, basically believing in one God Almighty. And number two, uh, we talked about worship. And we said worship includes number one, ritual, and also what you embrace in principle. So this is worship. So worship is more comprehensive than considering it just a, uh, just a ritual because it does involve principle as well, all right? Um, the third piece is basically the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that they would be only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one would share such attributes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, if they would associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word balla actually means, I want you to look at this one because this is pretty much the opposite. Remember the pattern that we talked about? That's the same thing right there. Balla actually means that they had lost their path. Okay, this is what it means. Lost their path. If we say somebody lost their path, that would simply mean that there was a particular destination that they were supposed to be getting to. A particular destination which is the purpose that they were supposed to be getting to in Islam, the purpose preceded the existence. Again, the purpose precedes the existence and not the other way around. In the atheist culture, or at least what John Paul Sartre, Sartre had considered, is that there is no purpose, though therefore you would create a purpose and consider that purpose does not precede the existence, but existence comes in and then you create a purpose for yourself. And that's the culture of postmodernism right now, in where sense it's all considering that life is nothing but matter in motion. And therefore you create a purpose, whether the purpose is, I don't know, to give money to the people of Africa or to become a well, popular person, whatever it is, then that's really um, the new purposes that people think that I've got a purpose and without them realizing the the purpose is actually preceding your existence just as the making of your eye preceded um, the, the whole idea the making of your eye and sight preceded the making of your eye hearing the idea of hearing preceded the making of your ear your ear of course and same thing with life the whole reason and the whole purpose of life actually preceded the making of life. Therefore, your existence and the purpose of it preceded your existence. Therefore, the, the purpose 
is basically since it came before life, then therefore we're supposed to be getting some information on what life was was basically made for, what we are living for. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and where they had actually lost their path and have gone very far away from even recognizing the purpose that they were created for, from recognizing the path that they were supposed to be getting to. Why? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had basically sent the prophets and the messengers to help you know the purpose that preceded your existence and certainly how to get to the purpose. That's sharia. Again, the prophets and the messengers were sent with the revelation in order to help you know the purpose that preceded your existence and how to get to it. How to get to it is sharia. The idea of why that is aqidah. That is aqidah. That's creed. Well, what is the purpose? That's aqidah. And that's extremely important to keep in mind because there's no way that you can actually get an information that is outside of you and even outside of your own creation because that idea or the whole idea of the purpose that you were created for is actually outside. The will for it is outside of matter in motion from the beginning. In other words, it is beyond nature. So whether you study all that you study in science, all that you're studying is telling you how things function and not necessarily why they run this way. What is it heading to? What is the purpose of all the different paradigms and all the different patterns and all the different things? Why is life like this from the very start? What is it made for? What is it made what is it made by? Who made all of this? There's no way that you're going to find it in science. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically telling you, well, this is beyond your intellect. So that's why he had sent the revelation. Because revelation in itself is actually a source of ilm, other and outside empirical studying or any empirical area. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, telling you that there were these three sources yes there's one side that's based on your intellect and it's basically what you would consider as basically a fact or probably research and probably your own speculation and there's the side where you can investigate with your own senses investigate with trying to understand things but then there's the other side and a very important one that actually acts as the foundation of fact. It, that is basically slash al-wahi. It is the revelation. The, the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent to the prophets and the messengers. So when you look at it's basically to tell you that the person because one, they thought that their place to find the purpose was their intellect, or they thought that the, the place was basically their own feelings and their own inspiration, their own intuition. They basically had went very far away because the only place that can help them find guidance is really the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent onto the prophets and messengers. <inaudible> I wanted to actually say before we get to this ayah, wanted you to actually look at this one. See, قال الضحاك as one of the stories for why this ayah was revealed, which is the ayah that we were just doing. In Allah لا يغفر أيشرك به, and he said a very important thing. So, um, yes, even Faurak was uh, Faurak was actually. Um, speaking, not Faurak, but Faurak, sorry, even Faurak, he's a Shafi'i scholar. All right. Um, and he was talking about the area of what we actually get from this ayah 
Yes, that the people, that there is a unanimous agreement between the scholars, at least the Shafi'i Madhab, and of course other Madhabs that said the same thing, in where the person that is kafir would be the only one to stay there forever, and that in Fasiq, we talked about this yesterday, we're not going to go into it, the Fasiq would basically, if he is Muslim, even if they did not repent, they would be punished in hellfire, but eventually they would leave hellfire, either by the intercession from the Prophet ﷺ or by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one side. If Bahak had said something um, really interesting, let me talk about Bahak a little bit. Okay, Bahak, his name is Bahak ibn Muzahim. Actually, we talked about him before, just remembered right now. Bahak ibn Muzahim, um, um, originally, we said that he originally was from. Uh, was from um, Afghanistan. So, all right, let, let's see the quote. من الأعراب جاء إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. And a man that is from Al Arab. Now, once one thing to say, when you look at Al Arab, they're basically the Bedouins. They're the Bedouins that were nomads. They were living basically away from the city, away from the people, and certainly their behavior is different. They're very primitive. Um, they're uh, very blunt in many ways. Uh, definitely, they did not learn how to deal with people, so definitely lack social skills and all of that. So that's when you look at Al Arab, that's to tell you that there is either a very uneducated or very primitive or somebody that is probably coming in with a very, uh, a very, uh, I guess, um, weird behavior because of lacking social skills so all right so he came to the prophet and he said oh prophet of allah i am a very old man coming with great and a lot of sins that i had committed yet i only did not associate partners with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since i had known him and believed in him and I had not taken outside of the Lord Almighty as a place of guidance. Here's the wale, as a place of guidance or as a place of support or as a, or a, an area to help with decision making. In other words, as a place of principle. And I did not fall in sin to basically, uh, you know, commit like an audacity or basically go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even out of pride. What and I am coming to the Lord Almighty with regret, repenting, and even asking for forgiveness. What is my situation in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed this ayah. That the Lord Almighty does not forgive people associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but forgives what is beyond that? I want you to look at right here in where, of course, remember whenever they would basically put a two here referring to the footnote. So here we go. Um, the footnote basically says tafsiru abilayt and tafsir al baghawi. So in other words, what the the uh, muhaqqiq basically, which is Shaib al arnaud in uh, in this case, he was basically saying, well, we couldn't really find the story as at least where um, the hack here would quote the story from. So where we found it from was basically in these two references. And these references did not have a chain of narrations for that reference, leaving that reference really um, up to basically this claim of um, reference and the story being mentioned by them. All right, but I like the story, even though it was mentioned, I don't see a chain of narration, but I like the story and thought of sharing it because of course, you know, we can be, if we can be falling in all these sins, but if this Shaykh right there comes to the Prophet and basically just displays himself right there and the Prophet basically gets the revelation in that area. So this is bringing us that, uh, I guess, glimpse of light that if somebody admits even their sin right before the Prophet ﷺ and says, hey, I've been committing all these different sins, man, I never did it because I wanted to somehow 
uh, go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or out of arrogance. I was really just, I guess, just doing it and it was just seeking more pleasure. In other words, I was basically weakened to my own to my own um, pleasures and my own whims. But then I regret doing all of that and I'm coming to with repentance and I'm asking for forgiveness. What is my situation going to be like? And that's when that ayah is revealed. All right. You know, <clears throat> Uh, this really, this story is really inspiring. Um, I remember um, doing, uh, you know, the chaplaincy in prisons and a Somali girl, of course, this is not at all to display Somalis, but um, at all. I mean, you'll go to prisons. I found Arab there and I found Somalis there. I found Palestinians there. I found, um, I found, you know, all nationalities, but um, the Somali girl basically um, tells me, you know, every time I would, it would be non-Muslims and Muslims, of course, in the session. And uh, when I'm when I'm talking about Islam, this girl all of a sudden just bursts into tears right in front of everyone. And then um, she asked me for a private session. So we do a private session. And then she was telling me of all the different sins that she had committed where she was living with this non-Muslim African-American, had a baby, and her family basically had, um, uh, well, only one aunt. So she basically was an orphan. And um, I don't know, but uh, this aunt claims that she was her mother in order to get her papers, um, uh, her aunt, that is. Um, and she really goes to the U.S., but when she goes to the U.S., well, her aunt didn't really care much about her, so she, well, maybe, who knows who exactly was it, what was at fault here, but at the end is that she admits that she had left the family and engaged in drugs, engaged in each and every single thing, but then, subhanAllah, um, just that day, and where she just says, I just want to make tawbah, I the, the, the government actually took her baby away from her as well. So look at that. She's in jail, um, got the baby out of Zina, and her baby was even taken away from her because they considered that she's not liable to take her, her baby. They put her, up, put her baby up for adoption, and um, then she asked me to contact her aunt and look for her. And that was, I guess, you know, the only way that I could do it was asking Somalis about the tribe, help me find this person. So alhamdulillah, we managed to find the aunt. We managed to basically, you know, connect them together and send her some money, um, you know, to eat in prison and all of that. But, you know, just looking at the tears, I could just, you know, visualize it right now. And just just as if you could, I could see it right now in where how that sister was in in these very, very um, warm tears and, and just crying nonstop. I barely spoke. She was just constantly just crying in, in, uh, in uh, asking me if there's any hope for Tauba whatsoever. I don't really know always what happens to the people after the sessions um, end and even after they leave prison, you know, what happens then it's, it's, it's not always something that is easy for me to really keep track of what happens to people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her hidayah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep her steadfast. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also unite her with her family and unite her with her child. Allahumma ameen. And she was telling me that she's once she leaves, she's planning to go to Somalia instead of staying in the U.S. because of the area being too contaminated. All right. I want you to look at this ayah right there because it's quite interesting in its coherence with the rest of the ayat. So right there, that they would basically, um, the word yad'un, the word yad'un could mean to invoke and could also mean to worship. So yad'un, uh, could mean to worship, could mean to invoke. Although the word to worship is more comprehensive than the word invoke. So when you're invoking, you're asking for support, you're asking for help, you're asking for a wish to be answered, all of that. That's a form of invocation. But yadrun is more comprehensive, which basically would mean and include ritual and certainly would include other types of 
uh, other types of worship and where other types of principle, what you regard as your area of wala. All right, your area of wala, your area of authority, your area of center, whether that is in aqidah, in creed, or whether we're talking about principle. So, that they would worship, or at least they would regard as a deity out, out, outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, they had claimed that they were females. Here's again, in the truth of the matter, what they are worshiping is nothing but a shaitan, a devil that is. Marida. I'm going to talk about Marida in just a bit. So right here, just looking at what does females have to do with all of this and with any of this? So the pagan Arab, again, you know, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about shirk. So here, since shirk was brought up, he wanted to talk about shirk that is within their context. Within their context, they basically had claimed that these idols were their place of authority, were their place of um, basically the place that uh, that determined their principle and certainly the place of uh, the place of principle in place of support in victory. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, what the, they actually worshipped is basically other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but illa inatha. They worshipped some female idols that they had basically made up. Where's the irony here? The irony is that within the Harabi culture, um, femininehood was actually a symbol and something that resembled weakness, something that resembled vulnerability, something that resembled inferiority. But then the irony is that although they recognized, or at least although they had considered, not recognized, but although they had considered that femininehood is symbolizing and a sign of all of the things, inferiority, um, weakness, all of that, yet it's really strange how they didn't recognize the irony and the contradiction of what they regarded was their place of victory, their place of uh, decision-making, their place of principle, their place of power. So how is it that you would not recognize that what you were really seeking as victory and as place of power, all of that is actually coming from something that you consider symbolizes for weakness, inferiority, and, and all of that. I mean, say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was trying to expose their own incoherence and, of course, expose the contradiction in their faith and how they would even contradict themselves and what their culture and what their religion actually stands for. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then, even though, you know, exposed their, their um, I guess, their uh, their contradiction and the contradiction in their faith, but then, then brings about the truth of the matter. It's not that they are worshipping these idols, the truth of the matter. So what does that mean? So, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, iyad'una min dunihi, that what they were really worshiping, so what this is really meaning, this is not to nullify the first statement. The first statement, yes, it basically affirmed that they were worshiping these idols, which they had attributed femininehood to, but it also added to that statement, and that's why it said, what? Adding to that statement, and what they were really worshipping is the shaitan as well. So this is not to cancel out the first statement, but this is in order to say that what they were worshipping is a shaitan. I should look at the word shaitan. Because the shayat, first of all, the, the, the female, or at least the idols that they were worshipping all right here i wanted to actually um i guess bring it out right there so the inatha the uh the pagan idol well the well no no the idols that they were the pagans were worshipping you could see that their names were let uzza manat and they actually had female partial female features some of them would actually be 
looking like a looking like a an eagle some of them would look like a bird some of them would you know just different animals but they also considered that they were basically uh the the daughters of Allah that they were the daughters of Allah and therefore regarded that those things were really um some form of deity to represent the represent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right now one thing is that when you look at shaytan um, when you look at shaitan, the piece of it, illa shaitan and marida. Yes, so there is the great shaitan, which is iblis, and the word iblis was mentioned in the Quran, so there's no doubt that there is iblis. Okay, um, and certainly it's not just iblis because iblis himself basically has different different abalisa or different shayateen that would sh shaitan and his junood and his soldiers and of course they basically would get children they basically have family and so forth but this shaitan they basically had worshipped him now here's something really important keep keep this one in mind right because we're really going to get to something really important here all right so they would obey the shaitan and then basically by that obedience they would find themselves actually replicating his behavior, which is marida. What is il marid? Il marid basically is anyone that is basically um, going outside of the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's il marid. So when you replicate and you worship or you take the behavior in the footsteps of a shaitan that is marid, you would actually become a shaitan marid yourself. Okay, so that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had basically talked about in Surah at tawbah that they had taken their own rabbis or their own priests as lords outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that to mean? That worship doesn't necessarily have to be where you would be in ritual. But worship could also be in what you take as culture. Again, what you take as culture. Why? Because certainly they were not worshiping their rabbis or even their priests. But worship is more comprehensive than ritual, which is also to include the lifestyle that you embrace and the practices that you would embrace in your life and consider them as the principles and basically what defines justice for you. So here, when you look at in other words, their lifestyle, they would obey the lifestyle of a shaitan and therefore that becomes really as a, a definition and also including a form of worshiping the shaitan. So this is not talking about Satanists. Satanists, they basically went straight to the shaitan, okay? But this is actually talking about even those that would associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they're technically worshiping is really the shaitan. So definitely, um, if you were to come up to somebody that is probably a Hindu, all right, and you're telling them that they're worshiping shaitan, they're going to tell you, you know nothing about our faith. We don't worship Satan. We're worshiping um, maybe uh, Brahma or whatever it is, or Ram or whatever it is, okay? Um, that's what we're worshiping. We're not worshiping Satan, and they'll basically tell you that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will tell you, well, what they would not recognize is that, okay, they are worshiping that Ram or whatever deity, but the truth of the matter is that they had actually embraced the dalal, the delusion that the shaitan had basically gotten them into. So the truth of the matter and what they don't recognize is that through and what got them into this type of idol worship is really a shaitan that they had embraced fully. Now, here's one thing. So, so when that's just like the Surah Al Baqarah where it says, Sumum Bukmun Omeun. You, you well, finish. So is, is, is really talking about from a different angle. Because, oh. sum, it, it, right. So, Sum, if a person, uh, whether we're Bukum and Sum, so basically they can't hear, they 
cannot basically communicate. That's a different area. This is basically talking about their uh, their beha behavior, their reaction to your da'wah, to the da'wah that you might give them. So that's actually oh. talking about from a different sense. This okay, is sorry. talking about, uh, this is scrutinizing the part about their ideology and where really it's coming from. In other words, it's not coming from truth, but it's actually coming from a delusion in where. I want you to look at this one because this is actually trying to take us elsewhere in where remember how in before we were actually talking about let's look at it right there we were talking about these parts and where yudluna illa anfusahum we talked about yaksib khati'atan yaksib ithman all of these different areas in where what really is sin how and what is the implication that it would have on you so then the ayah is taking you to recognize, well, what actually makes sin is number one in where if you don't recognize where your center is, if you don't know, recognize where your center is, then you're going to be basically driving off and really far away if you basically are trying to find your path, but you don't know where your center is, then you're just going to get lost and just roam around all around and basically not be capable of finding yourself. But it's really important to have one area. So if you're, I don't know, going with your children on a trip or anything, that there has to be one area that we would recognize that in, if we get lost, that that's the area that we will be meeting in. This is the center. If you don't have a center, then each and every single one is going to be roaming off. So that's where that area of center is. What this area is taking us into, <clears throat> number one, letting us recognize that the center is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or else you're going to find yourself actually one committing all these sins or at least committing all these things that are against your interest you're going to be basically abusing and oppressing yourself in other words committing actions that are against your own benefit against your own interest you're they're going to be a burden that you're going to carry they're basically going to be things that you may intend and may not intend but you're going to find yourself in a whole net of all these different all these different um, uh, all these different, um, I guess, uh, trips where you're just going to be completely lost. So in that situation, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically telling us where is this really taking us and what does this actually look like? So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically here mentions what some of them, so what some of them would take as an as a as an ideology would take as a practice would and how they would have all these discrepancies within their thoughts but then comes in <clears throat> um comes in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is right there exposing the truth of not only the discrepancies and the contradictions within their own ideology but also then the implication it has on their behavior I want you to look at this one because this is actually right there taking us elsewhere. All right. So telling us, well, yes, the ideology is taking them elsewhere. And you could see. That shaitan basically right there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had what? Now the word la'na that uh, the word la'na actually comes in because, of course, the word la'na is basically to mean that the person is expelled and not included in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so if we say that shaitan is expelled from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so then remember where you've got a center, you've got a decision, you've got a principle that basically is stemming from and coming from that center, that authority. And certainly that's where you get your backup from. And that's the same thing in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling you, well, if you are not seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your place of authority, as your center, and certainly the area of principle, what you're going to be finding yourself really in is coming into just like a shaitan in where 
he basically was not included in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet a very important thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings up in this ayah وَقَالَ لَأَتَّخِذَنَّ مِنْ عِبَادِكَ نَصِيبًا مَفْرُوضًا and he that is shaitan had said and made an announcement why because this is for you to know that you are being targeted here you're the target when he had actually said la atakhidanna i will take i will for sure and certainly take from your own servants nasiba mafruda assert as as something that i will be targeting at something that i will be taking and therefore taking as basically the goal in their life so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was right there in bringing us something very important your enemy is really the shaitan that went against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is this also saying this is actually telling us that many had actually went into dalal al-ba'id not necessarily by having some thought alone but the behavior itself could have actually brought in a, a certain ideology that took them away from reality took them away from truth it was really the behavior the behavior itself can affect the person's mind can affect the person's heart and can affect the person's soul in how they embrace the truth how they would apply it and how they would see the light in it and how they would recognize at least the discrepancies, the contradictions in other in the other ideologies or in other practices. And that's why when you look at Prophet Lut السلام, or Prophet Shu'aib السلام, they were emphasizing behaviors. They were emphasizing either we're talking about um, a social delusion, or at least the, the behavior that Qawm Lut were doing, basically a, a behavior, a social behavior that was not acceptable and certainly contradicting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created in their nature. And, so, uh, and the, the people of Shaib, they were basically engaging in an economical delusion or an economical manipulation and both manipulate manipulations, whether social or whether economical, or whether it was political, like the pharaoh, all of it is actually a form of a contradiction and simply going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was emphasizing these different forms of al-tamarrud al Allah. It's basically going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in where anybody that would replicate the behavior of shaitan to go against the aqidah, the truth, the nature, the social construct, the social, let's call it the uh, the, the social principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had regarded or the economical or political, political, and the list goes on and on, then you had basically replicated the same thing as shaitan. Once the person replicates shaitan, then in that situation, the consequence is going to be the same. The consequence is la'anahullah. That the consequence is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had basically expelled him from being included in his mercy. Now here's shaitan right there in where saying that he will be using his ibad, ibadika nasibam mafruda. He'll, he'll be using Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's here. This ibad is not here saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was allowing him to control those that are really in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This ibad, the word ibad, generally means servants, okay? But right here, this is not to mean those that are worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the ones that will be used, abused, and certainly uh, controlled by shaitan. I want you to look at these. Used, abused, and controlled by shaitan, all right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah basically quotes that when shaitan basically says that he's going to control, but then he says, Illa I won't be capable of controlling your servants that 
are embracing sincerity. So in other words, he recognizes that he cannot control those that are embracing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He won't be able to control them and certainly would not be capable of basically abusing or even using those people. So here, when he says, min ibadika he used the word min, which is litab'id. The word min is a preposition to mean some. So he cannot control all the people, but he will take some of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, some of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, basically the people, um, ibadika is a general thing, whether the person is kafir or Muslim, he is abdullah. He's basically a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What? Wait a minute. But he's not worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a abdun lillah in the general term to mean that he is basically a servant. He's basically uh, basically created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's, ser he's basically a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is another particular term, abdun lillah, to mean that this person is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person is really embracing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, embracing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the same thing. When we look at the, the words, it depends on the context, all right? So even if it's somebody that is kafir, they cannot go outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, basically rule and decree. Remember, when we talk about will, there is al mashia al kawniya and there is al mashia al tashriya. I want you to look at this one. All right, this is really important because many times people will get confused on that. So when we say Allah subhanahu wa taala, if somebody might say, well, if Allah subhanahu wa taala didn't want me to not worship Him, why didn't He force me? To worship him he's allowing me to do it that means he's accepting it so we'll say well a minute you're confusing two things there's in mashia al kawniya and in mashia al tashriya what is in mashia al kawniya so basically there's the natural decree and there's the legislating decree legislating decree so what does that mean so when you look at natural decree there's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the will gave you the power but he put that within nature he gave you the ability to choose whether you want to go to the masjid or go to the bar next to it he gave you the ability to choose to get married or choose zina as your way and the list goes on and on but does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting such behavior that's why there's al mashi at tashriya The Lord Almighty gave you a natural free will, but that does not mean that that free will, you basically, just by using it, that that's basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepting it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفْرِ And he does not accept for his servants disbelief. He does not accept disbelief upon his servants that's a legislating decree so we cannot say that just because we had the free will to do something that that's an evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting it or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is okay with it so here we go this is to explain that yes even for some ibad by nature everybody is basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servant but that does not mean that every single person is serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in legislature. All right? I want you to look at this one. Now we're going to the sensitive parts. So therefore, Iblis basically says, what's the tool that he will be using in order to, one, control, two, abuse, three, and use the people he says i'm going to use in order to get to let's see number one and here we go these are three things i will use delusion put a delusion give them some 
hope to live up to and give them an order. These are three things he will use in order to control. He will use, of course, a method. The method is going to contain of some kind of a delusion in a person's vision of what they would regard as their authority, what they would regard as truth. And then in practice, they will basically live in some kind of a, of a hope that this would basically take them into success. This would take them into happiness. This would take them into basically a better life, etc. because this recognizes that it's part of our nature that we're basically looking for a center of truth we're looking for a betterment of our life we're looking it's part of our nature that we're seeking success we're seeking some kind of a victory some kind of a uh, some kind of a settlement why because we recognize as human beings that we're seeking stability we work because we want to ensure a better future. We study because we want to ensure a better degree, a better chance of getting a, a, a job. We basically live to basically in search and making sure and of security. We eat basically to get uh, in, in hope of getting a better health, a better health, better security, better life, better future, Really, because we, and as part of our animal human nature, that we are seeking a way for survival. This survival piece of it is basically that part of our nature that we're seeking a certain hope in life. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Shaitan recognizes that we're searching for a center to look for truth. We're searching for a, a, a survival mode, survival means, different ways to give us stability, to give us hope in life. And so using these two, Shaitan will basically give you certain orders, certain hopes to get to basically a better future in life and will use the same method that he used against Adam alayhi salam. What was the method used? He basically told him, Who do not want me to show you off a tree that leads to eternity, eternal life, basically. You'll never find death. And a property, an ownership, basically, that would never perish. Looking at these two, he recognized that it's part of Adam's, or at least human nature, that we are fearful of death. We're fearful of our own ending. We're fearful of that fate. So what do we use in order to give us better chances of living? We basically use mulk. We use money. We use basically property. That's why, like we said before, people would stock into their pantries, stock into their closets, not necessarily because they need it, but because it gives them a sense of belonging, a sense of power, a sense that I'm safe. My future is safe. I've got all of these different things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then brings it up to us in where be careful. There's going to be a delusion. There's going to be feeling that you are missing something. So you would be in search and given hope that only if you were to access this route, that you will be granted happiness. So what should I do? Iblis will come forward and say, here's what you need to do to ensure your future, to ensure your rights, to ensure, um, to ensure um, uh, your a better life and a better possibility of basically surviving and therefore this is what you need to do so semicolon the practice they will engage in certain practices they will I want you to look at this one actually means to cut actually means to deform the ears for the different cattle or the ears of animals. What does this have to do with anything? So what was a common practice during the pagan era? 
is that they used to think that certain animals, once they would give certain, uh, basically give them the production that they would need, they would then give certain signs to let everyone know that these animals are now designated as holy for the sake of the idols. That is, of course, to them, for the sake of God or the gods. So what they did, exactly like they would consider here, that even though they regarded femininehood as a sign of vulnerability, a sign of weakness, inferiority, but they still attributed what was a sign of inferiority as God. So then, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying, well, what the, they were practicing, which deforming the animals as a way and a sign really to give sacrifice to the gods and without them recognizing that how is it that if you wanted to give a sacrifice and if you wanted to give something as basically special to god how is it that you would practice a deform uh, or deforming the animals as a presentation to god so basically right there showing them the contradiction within their practice and within their creed. And certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was also emphasizing that using using uh, the form uh, or at least the method of deform, deforming, um, whether different creatures deforming the different things in nature was basically a method in order to get to the hearts of people. So that's why you would see, for example, the Gothics, you would see um, different practices. My time, they were called the punks. And right now, I think they give them a different name. Um, all these different people, they would basically use the method of piercing, the method of tattooing, the method of basically deforming their appearances. And that deform was really in order to deform the shaitan would use in order to deform your inside so it would make it make you focus so, on so that's kind of like uh botox or uh, so all botox those surgeries that. people want to do we're, we're gonna get to that to cut so their feet up and, and okay we're gonna get to that so but just think of it and just keep in mind that deforming um whether things in nature so whether we're speaking about, um, you know, the way the method that they were using at the time, deforming the animals to bring them into sacrifice to the gods, or whether it was really deforming the different animals as a way to, to basically relate with the different things in nature, or whether, let's go for number two, and I would order them, order them to change the creation of Allah Almighty. Now, changing the creation of Allah Almighty is actually a key thing. Changing, deforming you, changing your appearance, changing, making you focus on the appearance and all of that is basically right there looking at khalq Allah changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically a method that shaitan will use in order to, number one, make you live. So here we go. Make you live in hope that this was going to give you a better appearance, that that was going to give you a better chance of probably being accepted, a better, a better chance probably of getting uh, somehow uh, that you are basically living in Lulal, that you're basically choosing yourself, you're not getting others dictating your lifestyle, you're basically representing yourself, you're basically letting yourself represent yourself, and then they don't recognize that they're actually really putting in words and sentences that don't actually make sense. And you would ask them, well, why are you doing this? It's basically because I want I want this to resemble who I really am. And what really this is resembling is one thing, which is the contradiction and the discrepancies and certainly all that confusion that they're actually living in. And that's a bunny. Now, who are the people that are going to recognize that all of this lifestyle 
in changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in changing, of course, their appearances and even their bodies, who's going to notice that it's basically from shaitan in order to get to their heart? So shaitan cannot control your heart, but shaitan can control, can, I want you to focus on this one, shaitan cannot control your heart. Shaitan cannot control control your behavior and what choices you make, but he can give you wiswas. He can basically give you dalal. He can basically spew thought in your mind, but he cannot control you to think in a particular way. It's that that's why the ayah basically emphasizes and that on that in where he says, "I had." I did not have any power over you. I just invited you. I I just told you. I just basically now to come. I basically called you to do a certain thing, but then you had accepted and you basically implemented. In other words, Shaitan doesn't have power. In this area right there, is actually key to understanding this ayah in where al-dalal and al-umniyat and al-amr they're basically a form of da'wah whether it's putting in certain thoughts to give in certain hope to put in a certain order shaitan does not control you but shaitan will basically use these methods to control your behavior, to control your behavior. Shaitan does not have the power to make you think in a certain way whatsoever. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيًّا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُبِينًا Whoever takes a shaitan as il wali, here's the word, wali, remember, il wali, authority, a place of decision, and a place of support. Anybody that takes a shaitan as authority, place of decision and practice, and a place of support and victory outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then surely khasira khusranan mubina. When you look at khasira khusranan, this is basically right there in where this type of maf'ul right there in where maf'ul mutlaq, in where surely had, remember in Arabic, khasira, khusranan, shariba, shurban, etc. All of that is basically to bring in an emphasis. Khasira, khusranan, is, why, is the, why is this word repeated? It's to bring about the absoluteness so that they would be absolutely, what is the verb that it's basically saying that's absolute, um, that verb, the word is khasira, il khusran absolute loss absolute defeat and absolute defeat even though khasira khusrana is enough to actually say absolute but then says and brings about another emphasis another clarification in where an absolute defeat that is clear that is obvious now a number of different questions right there those are the people that the word is ma'wa, so it's basically just like il masir, but the word is ma'wa and il ma'wa that those are the people that their ma'wa, they're basically they're the ending place that they will be dwelling in. What's the difference between il masir and il ma'wa? Il masir is basically talking about it from the sense of uh, the sense of time. Okay, il ma'wa is the sense of place. All right, that's a difference. So here, ula'ika ma'wahum jahannam, basically that is the place that they would be dwelling in, which is jahannam, wala'ijiduna anha mahisa, that they could not run away from. Why mahisa? Because this is talking about it from, this, from the sense of place. Here, sa'at masira, this is talking about a destination in terms of time. This is a horrible destination, this is going to be in terms of their uh, decree, basically their destination. This is their final uh, station right there. This is the difference between al-masir and al-ma'wa. 
And of course, a number of different questions come up from uh, from this area. Uh, oh boy, can't believe we passed this much. Is well, are things uh, like when we're speaking about changing appearances, when we're speaking about changing appearances or changing things in animals, does does that include um, things such as um, maybe Botox or maybe fillers or plastic surgeries or all these, or even, you know, the, the faces and what they do with the face, et cetera, is that considered as part of it? So I thought it would be a good idea to just uh, summarize all of this. And it's really important to remember that there is a very important hadith in that regards, which basically is a key um, is key to understanding this a I, I thought it's easier to actually take you to this right there very good website islam q and a outstanding website um, that they basically did all these different articles and answers to the questions and i use it often in order to basically get to i guess those ayat and those hadith to make it easy um, for you to actually see so there are two things here in where Yes, that ayah is one side, uh, the ayah that we're doing, but there is another hadith in where, um, in where uh, actually two hadith. So let me just, I want to show you just so that you would understand when the scholars have discussed the plastic surgeries, um, what about eyebrows, what about uh, fillers, all of these different things. They use this ayah, that they will change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they also use two ahadith as references. Those two ahadith, here's this hadith and here's this hadith. Those are the two key ahadith. Number one is that this hadith, Arfaja ibn As'ad. What happened? So his nose on the day of Al Kulab, basically it's a war on Jahiliya. Um, all right. What happened was that his nose was amputated during Jahiliya. And instead, because you know he, he had this appearance that didn't look very pleasant. So instead, he took a nose made of uh, made of silver. All right. But then, of course, with the body fluids, the nasal fluids, this silver was basically starting to rot. Of course, it was starting to uh, basically um, get in. Of course, you know, we would basically have different elements would be faster than others in how they would react. So this the body fluids were making this silver nose uh, react. And certainly it was making a very smelly area. In other words, the area was infected because of the silver on it. All right. And of course, when you would use something silver on an open wound, and certainly with all these fluids, it was basically starting to get infected, bring about a very unpleasant smell. So the Prophet ﷺ orders this man when he had become Muslim to take a nose made of gold instead. Why gold? Because gold is basically not as active as silver. It doesn't react with body fluids as fast as silver. So we know that in chemistry. So this hadith, you could say this hadith is actually Hassan. Let's go for another hadith in where Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated this hadith. All right. يَلْعَنُ الْمُتَنَمِّصَاتُ الْمُتَفَلِّجَاتِ لِلْحُسْنِ اللَّاتِ يُغَيِّرْنَ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ that the Prophet ﷺ had basically um, uh, cursed the women that do nams, and we'll talk about that in just a bit, and al-mutafallijati lil-husn. And nams is removing hair, so we're just going to talk about removing hair in just a bit. All right, removing hair, those that would remove facial hair at least, and we're going to talk about that. So, you know, let's just stop right here. And mutafallijati lil-husn. The, there was a common practice that they used to do during the time of the Prophet and during the time of Jahiliya, where they would braid their teeth and not make them you know, not make them basically full. So they would space out between their teeth to make it appear as if they were baby teeth. I don't know, re looks really ugly, really. But at the time, they used to think it, it was be a sign of beauty. So I know that Japan, that this is a sign of beauty until now. 
But here, the Prophet ﷺ basically said that they would do that that they would do that as a way of seeking beautification. Their intention is to seek beautification. And this hadith is basically made by Bukhari and Muslim. So for al-mutanamisat, we're going to talk about, it's not necessarily, you know, we're, we talked about facial hair uh, another time, so I'm not going to go in details to that. So um, I'll just make it a story short and just say removing facial hair is permissible. I'll make the story short because that's not my key point here. All right. Um, if we're talking about the eyebrows, um, that's a different story at, uh, to what extent. Okay. We'll talk about that later. But the question is, when we're speaking about this hadith, so this this Sahabi basically took a nose made of gold, and we know that men are not permitted to wear gold. And the Prophet ﷺ had basically per forbid that these women would change their appearance, whether it was their teeth or even the facial hair, um, in basically seeking beautification. So what does that mean? So based on these two hadith, the scholars had basically considered that there are different types of beautification. There's one that involves a necessity. The one that involves a necessity, whether due a deformity or whether due to a deformity that you are born with or whether that was a deformity that was basically later caused due a trauma or some kind of a uh, something that happened um then in that situation that would basically mean that taking and doing something that although is in general a change to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation even though here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasize that to change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is impermissible but in situations where it's causing a deformity that you are born with or a deformity that later happened due to a trauma even if it is by practicing something that is in the beginning or at least in uh in its first or at least in the general sense is haram to change Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation but this would be permissible in a situation where there's an actual deformity. It's permissible to fix whether somebody got struck by a car, uh, their face was basically uh, burnt or whatever it is. All right. Then in that situation, they can do a plastic surgery to fix it. Let's say their arm was amputated. They can do, um, I guess, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the arm or have... Uh, I guess a prostate, you know, the, the, those, um, uh, what, what do they call it? Help me. Prosthetic, uh, prosthetic arms or prosthetic, uh, uh, you know, different, different things to help that person basically survive. That's a different story. Same thing. If we're talking about things that could be in general, uh, a deformity in where due to, let's say, uh, a trauma, a trauma, not that we're born with, but later something happened. In that situation, whether they're born with an extra finger or whether it was a trauma that something happened to their body, to fix it is permissible. So why is it? And what about things in where I'm not here trying to fix an actual deformity, but I'm here trying to seek beautification? So if the person is trying to seek a beautification. So in that situation, you're basically doing two kinds. It's either beautification because of something anywhere. The beautification, it's not affecting your function, but it's affecting your appearance. So for example, it could be that a girl is born, let's say with maybe a deformity in appearance. It's not affecting her function, but certainly, let's say, a huge black spot on the face, okay? And this black mole on the face, it's not affecting her uh, her function. She's functioning well, but not functioning well within the society because of a clear uh, deformity in the appearance, okay? If it's a clear deformity in the appearance, 
then in that situation, it is actually permissible to correct that even though it's not affecting their function, okay? Number two, if it is not a clear deformity in the appearance, it's just that I don't feel good about it, then in that situation, this would be haram to do. Why? So like what? If we're talking about something that, for example, your nose, okay? It's not a clear it's not a clear deformity. It's, yeah, maybe you don't necessarily have the most beautiful nose, but um, you don't feel so comfortable about it. But of course, by whose definition is it not the most beautiful nose? Well, by the culture, not the most beautiful nose. But your nose is functioning well. Your nose is absolutely fine. It's basically not based on their, the, their definition of beauty, Basically, that stands out. So in that situation, that basically carries the same paradigm as just as the Prophet had forbid braiding the teeth or even changing certain facial hair to seek beautification, that would basically take every single behavior in where, whether it's changing your nose or whether it's changing the size of the breast or changing the size of the buttocks that you are trying to seek, not necessarily correcting a deformity, but you're trying to seek based on the standards of beauty at the time, you're basically trying to seek uh, some form of beauty based on their standards. That's a form of changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore it would actually be haram. Now, here's a question. What if we're basically talking about, what if um, we're basically um, talking about an actual deformity in the nose, okay? We're talking about an actual deformity in where, yes, the nose is really standing out and is really causing a deformity here. And I remember when I was a little girl, there was a lady who literally had um, a 30 centimeter finger, but she would, this is really long. It was, I, it was so scary for me to see really, but she would hide it with a piece of cloth, but it was definitely some kind of a mutation. All right. Some, it was literally, I know you wouldn't believe it till you see it. So all her fingers are okay, but one of the fingers is literally the size of a huge ruler. It was standing out. This is definitely a mutation. Can she actually correct that? She could definitely correct that and um, do a surgery. I don't know if she could afford it. That was back in the, I guess, early 80s. I was only uh, seven years old, but I remember seeing that really, it was really spooky for me as a child. And I would even have nightmares because it was, it was really, really standing out. Anyhow. So definitely they could do, um, whether it's a, if we're talking about an, a real deformity uh, in the appearance, so, uh, or even something that she was born with, okay? Um, so just to mention that point. What about not necessarily a deformity, um, but it's just an issue of age, time. I want to look prettier. Botox, uh, fillers the face they do surgeries to bring about the wrinkles and take away the wrinkles and i don't know what they do with these surgeries is that permissible or not number one there are differences of opinions between scholars since number one this is not an actual deformity but this is basically to seek some beautification the first opinion is that this is part of what this ayah was mentioning is that it is changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore it is haram. Okay? This is opinion number one. Since it's not an actual deformity. We're talking about things with age, etc. Number two is that the second opinion, they regarded that, well, if it's taking something to the actual creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created you in, then this is not changing the creation 
what this is actually taking you into the creation that you were in. So it is exactly like if I were to use, I don't know, some kind of a face mask and make my face look whiter or make my face appear um, smoother or make my face appear, um, I guess, younger, all of these different methods. And it's not put on to use these methods. So therefore, using the method if it's a 50-year-old woman, wanted to take away her wrinkles, wanted to basically bring it back to the way that it used to be when she was 20 years old and said, well, if we, the second opinion, they basically said, well, that they're, they supported their opinion. They're, she's not changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's just taking it back to the way that it was created in the beginning. Okay, so there's that second opinion in where they said, it is permissible if we're talking about due to age or due to basically um, something that with time or with a, a trauma, basically changing the appearance. So they're basically taking it back to the way it is. Now, that's different to those scholars. They basically said that's different than actually making a plastic surgery to change your creation. OK, this is not taking it back to the way it was, but this is to change your creation. So, for example, she basically decided, well, yeah, I'd like to have dimples. So what am I going to do? I'm basically going to make a surgery in order to get this nerve right there or whatever it is and or muscle. And that way I could appear like I have a dimple right there. All right. So this is changing the creation. OK, and same thing if we're talking about fillers. If the filler is not to put your creation back to the way it was, or basically for medical reasons, why are you putting Botox basically to take away, of course, the spider veins, etc. Well, that's basically correcting a deformity right there. Or let's say uh, uh, the, the Botox, for example, and of course, there are different types of Botox, just to know, there are four different types of Botox. But let's say this person is using Botox in order to appear at based on the our 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 modern standards or uh, modern uh, standards that this is to make you look more, more beautiful and in that situation this is a form of changing the creation of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and would certainly be haram. So this is here is the second opinion. So first opinion said haram. Second opinion they basically differentiated between um between changing the creation back to what it was and considered that it was basically halal if you're changing back to the way it was due to age etc um and or because if it's correcting a deformity then therefore it's um uh, it's uh it's permissible now third piece to mention is that just by not feeling good about something that is not the reference that we would turn to to say whether we with that is permissible to correct it or not so in other words not because you don't feel good about your nose or not because you don't feel good about your lips or you're lacking basically the confidence in your lips or lacking confidence in the size of your different body parts let's leave it at that that does not mean that it's permissible to actually do such surgeries, fillers, Botox, whatever it is, or put silicone or whatever it is that you're enhancing, then in that situation, that would be included in what the Hadith was talking about. They're doing it basically to fit in with a particular standard within that community and therefore this would actually fit what this ayah was saying the shaitan would use against us would use to control our uh, ourselves basically to make you feel that what is it so what is that? It's basically shaitan is using it against you. The problem is not in your lips or in your appearance. The problem is in the heart. The problem is in the spirit. The problem is in your confidence. Even if you were to make a surgery, even if you were to make that, 
you're still going to make surgery two, surgery three. It's going to be endless. Why? The problem wasn't in your appearance from the start. The problem was in living the umiyat, was in living the hope that shaitan was putting into you. It was a mirad from the start. So that's just in a nutshell, because I, I there's a lot more to say, really, but I'm just making this, you know, really short, even though, uh, you know, uh, so for the eyebrows, there are so many different lectures and so many different times that I actually talk about the eyebrows. So I'm not going to go in detail about that. Um, but certainly things like tattooing is definitely haram. There is no um, there is no uh, second opinion on the tattooing that it is entirely haram and it is a form that certainly shaitan will use against people in order to control them and certainly um, when we're speaking about tattooing it also affects the person's immune system and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was basically telling you what is good for you in order to basically do what is good for you and avoid what is bad for you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically wanting you to be healthy and tattooing and what about piercing a very important thing to mention about piercing scholars actually had differences of opinions in regards to piercing number one if it is basically causing a harm to the body then in that situation it would be haram one straight answer number two some scholars regard it as what is called il -muthla. what is il -muthla? Il -muthla actually means to deform the body. So some scholars regarded that any type of piercing, whether just like al Ghazali, whether that was just a simple ear, uh, you know, just a simple, uh, I guess, earring that you would have, or uh, just as, you know, those really simple ones, or whether it was multiple earrings, or whether it was a nose ring, or whether it was a uh, guess belly, whatever it is, that that was considered haram period because they considered it a deformity period the second opinion that regarded something like a like an ear piercing or at least one ear piercing they regarded that it is halal or even if the second the third opinion pay attention to this one the uh, which is extremely important when we speak about piercing we cannot take it out of the context within that society and its impact on the person. Because when we speak of beautification, when we speak of certain behaviors, certain cultures, etc., the Prophet ﷺ actually said, uh, actually said, Man whoever imitates any group of people, then you have become part of them. This is key. And Tahir ibn Ashur actually mentions a very important thing here. And he mentions that this hadith that we had mentioned before, where this hadith, well, let's go back to this hadith, he mentions that this hadith, that that this hadith is basically involving any behavior in where it was a practice that was common with the women that were engaging in a certain behavior in where it was basically their way of saying that they're available. It was basically saying and speaking and telling the men and fitting in in a certain culture that they are available for whether flirtation or basically um, trying to seek attraction, et cetera. And that was their way of beautification, to do their eyebrows in a certain thin way, to basically braid their teeth in a certain way, to do tattooing in a certain way. It was basically one way of fitting in with a certain culture at the time. And today, if a certain culture, whether that meant we're talking about nose piercing, we're talking about lip piercing, tongue piercing, certain piercing, where it is to fit in, in a certain group of people, in a certain culture, that would basically take the ruling for that particular piercing. Because the, what is beyond the piercing is basically the intention behind it. 
the intention behind it is to fit in a certain group of people is basically to be um, considered basically uh, being part of a certain culture. But in that situation, the ruling would be man tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum. To be honest, I do not find anything more disgusting than tongue and nose piercing. I think, and especially the piercing in between the nostrils, the one that they would put in them in in the in between, that is extremely disgusting. I do not find anything more disgusting more than tongue and even the nose piercing, because with the nose. It's basically collecting all this nasal uh, discharge, the least to say, and it's basically just disgusting. And where Islam was asking you to clean your nose with every single wadu and to just keep it your, of course, your nose ring and nose piercing. Imagine the amount of disgust it's collecting. And I know it's part of certain cultures and sub, uh, sub Indian cultures in where it's considered a sign that, you know, when a woman gets married, etc. But subhanAllah, I cannot whatsoever find in those piercings, especially the ones that they would put in between in where it makes the person look like a cow. I cannot see how on earth they regarded that as beauty. It is nothing but disgusting. Same thing with tongue piercing. And a person actually having and thinking that by putting some kind of piercing on their tongue, that that somehow makes it attractive. SubhanAllah, you could see, you could see how Shaitan knew where and how he could control the people. And Khasira, Khusran and Mubin really have lost their health, really have lost their appearance, and really made them look nothing but uglier. And on the other hand, by, while those that would follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walladina amanu wa amilu salihati sanudakhiluhum jannatan tajri min tahtiha al-anha khalidina fiha abada wa'ad Allahi haqqa wa man asdaqu min Allahi qila on the other hand those that would believe those that would on the other hand of course contradict what shaitan is doing and act in accordance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's principles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says sanudakhiluhum we will let them enter a jannat, a paradise, where would, there would be flowing rivers underneath it and forever they would dwell in it. And of course, certainly this is in order to let them know that it would be khalidina fiha, they would be living into eternally in it. And this is a promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made as truth. And there is no one more truthful than the Lord Almighty and his words. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And this is the end for today. I, I could have actually ended here, but I had to actually make sure that we don't end an ayah because we never know when we'll die. We have to end it with something that is giving us a promise, something that is reminding us of Jannah. And that way, inshallah, end it right there, inshallah, with a good khitamuhu misk. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all husn al khatimah and give us all um, the reward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise us that sanudukhiluhum and make us amongst those that will be sanudukhiluhum jannat and tajrim tahti al anha. I hope I completed for today, inshallah, and barakallahu fikum. Any questions before we end? I guess everybody is. Is like, ah, oh, you passed your time by 15 minutes anyways. All right. So, inshallah, we'll see you all. Uh, we still have tomorrow. So, we'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. And, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.